guest today is one of the great spiritual masters of our time. Awarded, celebrated, awarded the Nobel Prize. One of India's great national inspiration. I'm delighted to welcome you. Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy help define our contemporary world. My guest today is at the hub, at the center of uh, India's financial markets. He's chairperson of uh, the Security and Exchange Board of India. He's had a long and distinguished career as a bureaucrat and working and dealing and, and engaging in the shaping of the financial markets as the head and chairman of the uh, National Securities Depository Limited, he played a pivotal role in introducing and moving financial transactions away from the use of paper to what was commonly referred to as uh, DMAT. Uh, he's a Gandhian at heart and has the formidable reputation of making it a point to work on October the 2nd every year, uh, as that's what the Mahatma would have wished I'm delighted to welcome uh, Mr. C. B. Bhave. Thank you. Uh, what is a Gandhian doing at the center of for so much money, <laughs> you know, floating and moving around you? Thankfully, uh, <laughs> I uh, neither have the money nor do I need to manage it, so uh, I'm lucky. But as the regulator, you are dealing very substantially with very important and significant issues which involve, I don't know what, thousands of crores. Give us a brief sense of what SEBI does, what is SEBI, and uh, what is, is, is the scale and the size of the market that you regulate? Actually, uh, when we talk of uh, regulation of the capital markets, probably at the heart of that regulation are uh, two basic ideas. One is uh, that uh, the corporates uh, raise money in this market by telling people that we have XYZ plans, this has been our performance and uh, we need to do this. So uh, please be co-owners of this enterprise and we'll issue you shares in return for the money that you contribute. So the question that comes up here is that while selling these securities, was there truth in securities? So did we disclose everything to the investors and then leave it to the investors to make a judgment? So we, we need to regulate that area from the point of view of transparency and full disclosure. The other uh, fundamental reason why capital markets tend to get regulated is that uh, the investors have to deal through a series of intermediaries. And uh, when intermediaries uh, deal uh, with investors' money, other people's money or opium as it is called, <laughs> uh, you've got to make sure that the agency function is performed properly. In this uh, this process, uh, what are the what is what is the, the 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 size and the scale of what you're dealing and 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 relative to say some other parts of the world and, and other markets? We are uh, still a relatively smaller size compared to uh, the U.S. markets, but in the last ten years, India has seen considerable scaling up. Uh, today our market cap uh, capitalization, as they call it, is of the order of about $1 trillion and uh, that's not small anymore, though we have miles to go before we can catch up with the Western world. You've had a, a, a previous uh, tenor uh, with SEBI uh, as an executive director and that was about the time in the sense and, and, and you, are, you are credited with playing a very significant role with setting up of the national uh, stock exchange, uh, that uh, you know previously it was just you know the you know the the, the the intermediaries were sort of called like a broker's club, to something that has become much more sophisticated and accountable, and yet we seem to see uh, SEBI responding, and that's a good thing, you know responding to needs as they occur. Uh, to to what degree does that have to happen, as opposed to uh, anticipating problems and situations that might arise because there is the experience of uh, other stock markets. So to how much is, is it just learning as, as things happen? Actually uh, part of it is learning as uh, things happen but um, all regulators I think at the end of the day have to be humble enough to concede 
that the market will be three steps ahead of them. The market will keep innovating and uh, when innovation takes place uh, both forces, forces which are positively innovative as well as forces which are looking to uh, earn some extra buck at the cost of others both will be at work. And it is uh, very difficult to imagine a situation where we will be able to prevent mis-selling or misdoing altogether. So, it has to be a combination of uh, trying to anticipate and uh, taking action as well as demonstrating that if somebody were to indulge in misdemeanor, then there will be adequate punishment at the end of the day. You know, I am talking about in, you know, some of the, the, the sort of uh, initiatives which have been uh, given greater emphasis in only recently like insider trading uh, and, and of course, I mean that is a concept that has been so deeply embedded uh, that people will pass on information to fix the system. Uh, Could not have this have been in some ways anticipated? We know that insider trading is has been widely practiced, it is practiced everywhere in the world and perhaps even to argue that there is only so much we can do because you can always sort of whisper in someone's ear and you cannot control it. But let us look at like, like, like you know, an issue like insider trading uh, uh, where there are so many elements uh, to it that it is impossible perhaps to completely police it uh, and yet it can have a very strong powerful impact on the market and the in interests of investors who are not networked to get inside information. So, how do you address an issue like that? Actually, um, insider trading as you uh, say is an important issue, but uh, the wider issue is information asymmetry. So, some people have some information which the others do not have and how are they uh, supposed to behave when they have this information. Uh, and if you take the specific case of insider trading, while this was an offense in the US on account of the 1933 and 34 acts that they passed, their first successful case in insider trading got uh, actually uh, done in sometime in the late 50s. And uh, even Europe did not recognize insider trading as a serious issue till uh, as late as the 80s. So, it is not as if we are far behind, we were probably not a market oriented economy. So, we did not pay much attention to issues like insider trading and we have come on steam as we have liberalized and uh, turned our economy more towards a market driven mode. So, in, in a general sense, uh, you know what reassurances can you offer particularly to sort of non-professional uh, investors. I mean, you know, the professional investors know the system and they know how to beat it or to work around it or whatever it is. But I mean, traditionally called, you know, described as as, as the small investor, uh, that the market is in fact fair and clean, and you can trust the information uh, that you receive, and uh, you, you know, you can, in, in some measure, significant measure, be reassured that it's a level playing field. What reassurances can you give and what are they based on? Actually, uh, there are uh, two stages to this. Uh, the reassurance comes from the fact that we have enough legal provisions and uh, uh, regulatory provisions to be able to say that uh, uh, trading on the basis of uh, this kind of asymmetry of information is not on. But uh, in more practical terms, that reassurance should also come from the fact that uh, some people who have done this are seen to be punished, are seen to be asked to disgorge uh, the extra money that they have made, may have made on account of this. So, I think uh, laws have their own uh, place, but the implementation of laws is what really creates confidence in the society that these laws are for the benefit of everybody. You are watching a conversation with C.B. Bhave, Chairman of the Security and Exchange Board of India. We will be right back after a short break, do not go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with uh, Mr. Bhave, uh, the chairperson of uh, SEBI. Uh, you were just talking about uh, you know mechanisms to uh, you know penal mechanisms perhaps and that is not just law. You have recently you have had some sort of innovations where you uh, you know get in the, the wrongdoer and have a conversation with him and negotiate with him or whatever and then there is a there, there is a penalty and, and the matter is resolved as opposed to getting involved with convoluted uh, legislation. Uh, 
it, it, you've been described in, on, on certainly on the net at many places as a Gandhian. <laughs> so, what are the applications of some of these Gandhian principles in, in, in conflict resolution uh, that comes in with in situations such as this? Uh, actually, um, a consent uh, order mechanism or uh, compounding of offenses is not a new concept to jurisprudence. It's been applied even in India in some areas especially in the area of financial uh, misdoing, uh, this has greater relevance because the assumption behind that is that a majority of intermediaries would much rather get on with life than engage in a long lasting legal battle. And uh, if we are able to ensure that the undue profits made by people are taken away from them and there is some penalty on top of that then to insist that the ultimate letter of law is proved may be a wrong usage of time and effort by both the regulator as well as the intermediary and therefore uh, this consent mechanism has been introduced recently. One has to be careful though as to what kind of conversation we are having with these entities and whether we are ensuring that the integrity of the process is maintained throughout. So, what we have done is that uh, after the SEBI officers have negotiated with the intermediary, the whole case is put up to a high powered advisory committee which is headed by a retired high court judge. Give us a sense of the, the, the redressal methods and, and the avenues of uh, access to redressal processes that the, uh, that, that, that the small investor has. And I'm not talking just about, uh, you know, if a dividend is not received and, you know, uh, you know there is an error in, in, in the demand. If, if, a, if, if uh, a, a small investor actually feels that there is a, sing there is a, a, a significant issue of, of credibility, of, uh, uh, of something systemic uh, that is a problem uh, that he wishes to address, what are the mechanisms that he can use? I mean, if he feels, for example, that an issue that you have addressed, and we'll come to that in a minute, you know, on the IPOs, that you, you know, you put in a, a whole lot of money and these people just sit on it, uh, and you're addressing that. How can he raise it, and, and, and how do you respond? What are the mechanisms? We have uh, two, three mechanisms through which the investors could come to uh, SEBI. Um, they could file a complaint with us. Uh, they could even email that complaint to us. On the web, there is an address available where such complaints could be addressed to SEBI. Uh, we also have a dialogue uh, on a quarterly basis with uh, the investor associations that we have recognized all over the country. And we encourage these investor associations to take up the larger issues, as you said. One may be just that he has not received his dividend, but another may be that you have a systemic issue and the investor associations tend to raise that. In addition, uh, what SEBI does is that if we are getting uh, complaints which have a certain pattern, then we would like to see whether this is just a question of some individual not receiving service satisfactorily or do we have a systemic issue there. And in fact, just to go back to what happened in SEBI between 92 and 96, we used to be flooded with complaints regarding their shares not being, investor shares not being transferred in time, the company having posted those shares but investor not having received them, the whole issue regarding transfer. And in a sense, DMAT was a systemic answer to that. And now we do not have complaints of that kind anymore. What happens uh, in, in cases uh, where, uh, you know, th th there is an intermediary, say, you know, dealing with mutual funds and, um, you know, banks deal with mutual funds and, and, and offer those services. And in, 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 in many cases, uh, they do not seem accountable to any single regulatory authority. I mean, they are sort of partly dealing with mutual funds, but it is because it is wealth management under the umbrella of a bank and uh, they and, and, and they are really just claiming they are doing wealth management when they are not. So, there is sometimes confusion and ambiguity as to who the regulator is. Uh, how, you know, what, what, what mechanisms when, when issues such as that arise because, you know, we are coming up with more complex products, we are coming up with more complex processes. Uh, and, uh, you know, very often the small investor is confused. I mean, who do I go to? Where do I handle this? Uh, is there a law already that exists covering this? Um, is there a jurisdiction that goes 
beyond SEBI, is there somebody else that you turn to? Actually, uh, the point you have raised is uh, very important because uh, products are getting complex. They are going across regulators and in India the reality is that we have a separate regulator for uh, capital markets, a separate regulator for banking, a separate regulator for insurance and a separate regulator for commodities markets. And now uh, we might have a regulator for the pension fund uh, regulation as well. And uh, there will be products that will uh, go across regulatory jurisdictions. Uh, government has created a mechanism uh, of a high level uh, uh, financial regulators committee where the RPI, SAB, RIDA, and PFRDA all of us meet and discuss these kinds of cross regulatory issues. But uh, as we go along this regulatory cooperation will have to increase and we will have to make sure that we evolve mechanisms of the kind that you are suggesting that if an investor has a problem which goes across regulatory jurisdictions, there is a formal mechanism through which he addresses. I think this is uh, something that uh, needs to be done. Mm -hmm. What about the role of, of, of the courts? So uh, is, is the law that governs and protects the consumer limited to what the regulations of SEBI are? Uh, and and, and is, is a consumer able to go beyond that and say, look, there is tort, there are larger issues of you know, laws, laws of contract, and to go beyond that. And how dynamic is, is the government in creating those laws uh, that will protect uh, investor interests? Actually, uh, there are a whole lot of issues uh, connected with that. If you find deficiency of service um, by any entity, then for a consumer, it is open to go to a consumer court and say that uh, an XYZ service entity did not deliver the service properly. And we have seen consumer courts uh, give uh, judgments in the area of capital market where they found that the deficiency of service existed. We also have the issue of, uh, as you pointed out, the law of contracts not having been and you have the whole civil court machinery for that. You have uh, cases where the behavior may be criminal, in which case the whole criminal court machinery is there. In addition, for violation of securities laws, government has created an appellate mechanism because SEBI is not the last word, which is equivalent to a high court. So there is a separate uh, bench that has been formed, which consists of a retired high court judge and two experts that uh, government appoints from the area of capital market who uh, act as an appellate authority for SEBI and the appeal from their decisions is directly to Supreme Court. Is there, is, is, there a, is, 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 is your response time bound? Are you obliged to respond within a certain time frame? What are your obligations to, to investors who come to you? Yeah, there are uh, no written down obligations obviously because each complaint will be of a different nature. Um, we try to ensure that the complaints are at least acknowledged within a period of 15 days. And then depending on the nature of the complaint, uh, we resolve them. Of course, for quasi-judicial matters, uh, there are no time-bound uh, limits. Our experience uh, with regard to this special appellate mechanism that the government has created has been excellent. You are watching a conversation with uh, uh, CB Bhave, the uh, chairperson of the Security and Exchange Board of India. We'll be right back after a short break. <music> Welcome back to a continuing conversation with the chairperson of SEBI. Let's get at the, you know, the, 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 the man, uh, you know, behind the driving seat in, 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 in a sense uh, of um, the stock markets in India. Uh, or, or, or shall I say the policeman <laughs> or the police commissioner perhaps. Um, uh, you know, and I get back to this, 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 this idea of uh, a Gandhian who insists on working on October the 2nd. Is that true? Well, um, yes, I <laughs> try my best. <laughs> I have always believed that it was uh, uh, some kind of a paradox that uh, we uh, actually go on a holiday on the birthday of the person who believed in work ethic and who wanted us to work even harder on 2nd October. So I find that a little bit of incongruity. 
and in my little way I try to correct it. And how do you think that uh, Gandhiji would have uh, you know, perhaps responded uh, to the stock market and all the things that it embodies and uh, represents and, and he might perhaps have been glad that it was someone who's inspired by him that's a police commissioner <laughs> and not someone uh, you know who's, who's, who's inspired perhaps by Adam Smith I don't know uh, but uh, h how do you feel he would have felt uh, with the principles of, of the stock market uh, with the idea that uh, you know you, you really raise money in, in, in substantial ways by speculating as opposed to the entrepreneur who's actually raising the money, hopefully, uh, with Gandhian principles to create goods and services that will serve the community. Uh, it's a little difficult to um, imagine how uh, Gandhiji would have reacted to all this, but uh, his thoughts on uh, wealth are worth remembering even now. And he always used to say that uh, the people who have something more than the ordinary people have that in trust and they must look upon that uh, as trust and uh, I don't think that concept is related only to material wealth I would imagine that if somebody has brains that are uh, far better than ordinary people's brains then even he must look at his intelligence or his ability to grasp things as a trust given by God to him and try to see whether at least a part of it, I mean we, we are all at some level uh, interested in uh, our own welfare, but at least a part of it, can it be used for the common good? You know, when you say the sort of the enormous, enormous turbulence uh, in, in, in the stock markets and uh, you know, fortunes being made and people being wiped out, uh, you know, as, as a function perhaps of, uh, I was just going to use a horrible word and say greed and, and here was the great Mahatma who said well just think about your need and don't worry too much about your greed <laughs> you know did, uh, what, what personal feelings you know come up for you uh, you know as someone who must uh, you know fundamentally understand you know the markets as to the degree that one can I mean you know <laughs> I mean, even the great Warren Buffett has, has, has now and then stumbled um, you know what what personal feelings come up when you see uh, you know sort of the play of of samsara and the stock markets unfolding yeah, I guess um, one realizes at the end of the day that uh, all human beings are not driven by only noble thoughts but I guess the whole attempt in Gandhi's life was not to deny that uh, greed exists or that selfishness exists, but to constantly try and create a greater space in human mind for some selfless thoughts as well. And uh, those selfless thoughts in a larger sense are not all that selfless because in the well-being of people around you is also your well-being. So it's not entirely selfless to say that uh, you need to work for the welfare of others as well. You've had a long and distinguished career in the administrative service. Uh, and uh, what prompted you to go into the IAS? Um, you know, the, uh, uh, in, in today's world, I think you know a lot of people go into the IAS saying that they were they're motivated by a spirit to serve. But there are also issues of influence and power and security and, and, and so many other aspects that come into it. What motivated you and how far do you think those, those motivations have been fulfilled? Uh, very interestingly, I did my graduation in engineering. And um, then uh, when I started thinking about what is it that I like best, I thought that uh, people contact was one of them. I would have found it very difficult at that stage to get into a career that isolated me from uh, general people contact and therefore uh, going into academics, going into research or alternatively going to a, a shop floor where you would be in contact with only just those many people was out. And um, in those days opportunities were limited. I thought this is one career which will give me uh, tremendous people contact 
I also saw it as an opportunity uh, because civil service gives you exposure to so many other areas, so many different areas, as an opportunity to learn a lot. But I won't claim that I was a Mahatma driven only <laughs> by the consideration of public service. So to what degree have, have, have these, uh, these agendas? Well, agenda is not a fair word. Let's say these aspirations, the gentler word, <laughs> have been met and, and, and fulfilled. And in what ways? I think I've been uh, exceptionally lucky and uh, got exposure to a wide uh, set of areas. Uh, but as you grow up, you mature, some of your thinking changes. And uh, over a period of time, I started realizing that uh, every three or four years getting exposure to a new area may not be the best thing, uh, may not uh, be the best thing from my personal point of view as well as the point of view of the job that I would be doing. And it was purely by accident that I came into the capital market regulation area. Mm -hmm. um, seemed like a good idea to stick on. Uh, after about four years of regulation, I thought that I have been uh, for too long in uh, trying to tell people what to do. Let me just go to the other side mm -hmm. and see how it feels like when other people tell you what to do mm -hmm. and whether you can actually do something. So in that sense, the uh, transition to NSDL mm -hmm. was uh, personally very en enriching for me. I should share with you know with the viewers and and and, and, and you can only you only have to confirm the story if it's if <laughs> you're comfortable doing that and that that when you know the job was being offered to you as chairperson of SEBI there was a great deal of reluctance uh, because there was a dispute uh, between uh, in in your incarnation of, of NSDL and then SEBI and, and you really didn't want a conflict of interest and it took considerable persuasion uh, to you know, to have you take on this uh, this responsibility. Um, at the end of this 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 tenure, and I, I guess this is a this is a classic question. Uh, what will you have hoped uh, you know to have achieved? Um, you know, th there are s you know several initiatives that have begun to appear. You, you've been in the job for you know less than six months, um, but uh, at the end of it, what would you like? people to say of you, apart from the fact that he was a man of integrity, he was a good man, he was an honest man, and he, you know, did, made an impact on it. What are some of the, the how, how would you like to change or impact the texture, the, the ethic, the, the substance uh, of what happens in, this, in the stock markets, in the capital I, I markets? I think um, the ambition of any uh, public servant uh, would be, at the end of the day, that uh, uh, people around him would think that he did an honest job that he gave his hundred percent to the job. Uh, success or failure at doing certain things ultimately depends on many factors other than uh, your own capability and therefore it's very necessary for us to realize that uh, uh, success is not our own nor is failure entirely due to us. But the satisfaction that you gave your hundred percent that uh, your integrity was unimpeachable, is what uh, I would uh, imagine I would want others to think of. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the Mahatma would have uh, celebrated this disciple. Thank you Thank very you. much. This has been a Thank great, you, great program. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>